Welcome to the Even Better Podcast, where your host, Seneca Waugh of Your Clear Next Step, brings you exciting content about making communities better by helping people get even better at work. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. This is Seneca Waugh with the Even Better Podcast. This is part of our ongoing mission at Your Clear Next Step to help people have better work days so that together we can co-create better communities. So this is the Even Better Podcast. I am so delighted to have my friend Daniel McCrane with us. Daniel, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, I'm so delighted that you reached out and invited me. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Yeah, we've been planning this for a while. I'm glad that it finally finally got our schedules to align. So for those of you who don't know Daniel McCrane, he's based here in the central Iowa area. Just I've had the wonderful opportunity to get to know Daniel these last several months, uh, going on a little more than a a year now, I think that we've been in uh, similar networking groups and and I've just had the opportunity to connect. And I love his heart for helping business owners just be more successful and be more capable in their space. And it's, it's so wonderful. So for those of you who don't know Daniel, he's the founder of McCrane Associates, a business and marketing strategy company here in central Iowa. Daniel's work has helped companies save or make over 22 million in capital and expenses. So that's like real dollars. We're, we're not, this is not just a, a mom and pop sort of idea here. This is, he finds real money and make over 22 million in capital and expenses. And he's referred to as the maestro of business. I love that phrase. So he's a leadership and business coach, nationally recognized award-winning training professional. Uh, you have seen some of his stuff perhaps on a variety of places. If you check out his website, you can see more of the the places on ABC and Fox and CBS and Fast Company. And here in Iowa, you encounter him with the Truth Networks and others. So just great places that we've seen Daniel around. And I am so delighted, Daniel, to, to have you share this time with our listeners. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I'm excited to talk about this topic too. Uh, when we started talking about how can we share five things that I've learned from my experience. I thought of this topic today. I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about uh, and aligned with your purpose. How can we make everyone's workday better by talking about one of my favorite things to talk about music. Music, And this is so great. So I, I, I'm so intrigued by your, by your title here. It was five things you learned about business from conducting an orchestra. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so we got to backpedal a little bit. So I've shared just a little bit of your bio, but maybe tell us a little bit of your story and, and how orchestra played into that so that then we can understand the rest of the connection. Sure, sure. Well, I'm going to keep everyone in suspense here a little bit, I think, and I'm just going to give you the beginning and the end. So I started my career as a band director. I actually have a master's degree in instrumental conducting. I taught music for nine years and skipped through all the middle part. Now I am a business strategist. So I'm going to connect those two things together in this talk, but I'm going to leave out that middle for a little suspense. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. Okay. So five things, let's get right to it then. Five things you learned about business from conducting an orchestra. So the first one you described is vision and planning. So talk to us a little bit about that. What does, what does that mean? And what's your story there? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we we're all aware that in business, you need to have some kind of foresight. You need to have some kind of planning, uh, some kind of vision for where you're going to go in your business. So when I would prepare a piece for performance, when I was conducting, there are a lot of decisions that an orchestra conductor has to make about the piece of music before you even set foot in the rehearsal room for the very first time. And that means doing a little bit of research on who was the composer, why was this piece written, what is the intent that the composer was trying to create through this piece of music. You are trying to realize the vision, bring to life the vision that the composer had when they created this piece of music. And the other important point to know is that there's so much interpretation that goes into the performance as well. So it means diving in and studying what are the key points that I want to bring out? What's the balance that I want to have? What are the highlights that I want to draw out of this piece of music? So it's really diving in, doing a full-scale plan of how this piece is going to sound when it's all said and done, and then figuring out how are we going to get there. And that's exactly what we have to do with business. You have to have that, you know, we talk about our vision statement or our mission statement for our organization, for our business. You may never get to your vision. And honestly, 
I hope you never do. That's not the point. But you need to know what that vision is. What are you heading towards? And now let's come up with a plan for how you're going to get there. Absolutely. Well, and as a, so I was a career project manager for many years. And so planning is certainly like, that's, that's in my fiber. You're speaking my language there. <laughs> when you remind us that as business owners, we need to have that, that plan. But I love the way you brought together the, the idea of the vision, seeing the picture, hearing it in your head, right? Being able to imagine what it's going to look like. And then how do you actually execute on that? Wow. Right. <laughs> So, so do, do you uh, do you talk to your clients when when you're engaging with your customers about the vision work or the planning work that they need to do? Do you do you talk to them about you know scores of music and do you, do you bring this this illustration up with them as well? I do. Uh, it helps to have something to relate to, uh, another story to talk about. And so I talk about trying to create a piece of music, trying to, you know, where does the word come from? How to orchestrate all of the parts of your business. It, it's the same word. And there's a reason that that word is used in both realms, uh, both in music and in business. I love it. I love it. So, okay. If you're just joining us, we are here with Daniel McCrane. We're talking about five things you learned about business from conducting an orchestra. First one was on vision and planning. The second one is this, this reality that everyone has a part. And now this is near and dear to my heart. I, mean, I know I'm a planner, but, but this one too, they're like, there are all kinds of people that work in our business. Everybody has something that they're doing. And at your clear next step, we're committed to making sure that everyone has a good work day, right? That is part of it is, is if you go to work, you're part of something. We want to help you have a good work day. How does that tie in? How do, how do, how does everyone's work day or everyone's work contribute to the overall goals as an orchestra conductor or in business? Well, of course, right. It, and it's so easy to use an orchestra as an example of how everyone plays a part. And of course, we even use that term, you know, what's your part in orchestra? So when we look at music and begin to break it down from the musical world, we talk about the pyramid of sound. So we've got treble voices that are up at the top. Those are the higher voices. That's usually where the melody is. Uh, so I'm trying to speak now to people who may not have a music background, but at least you listen to music. So you kind of know what I'm talking about. So you've got the higher voices. We've got middle voices, which have the harmony and they support the melody. And then we've got bass voices at the very bottom. And this is the foundation. Everything, uh, all, the whole musical structure has to be built on this foundation on those bass voices and so everyone plays a part when i used to teach fifth grade band these are the kids who are coming in they're brand new they're trying to pick an instrument trying to figure out where they want to play what instrument they like to play i would hear this frequently from the parents i would hear parents say well is that a melody instrument because i want my child to play a melody instrument and sometimes even the students would say well, you know, my part's not all that important. I just play this part that, that's down here. But it is all important. Everything is important. If you were to look at a, a page of music for a band or an orchestra, uh, we refer to that as the score. You see that score with all of the different instruments listed. Sometimes the instruments are playing the same part. But then you see that other instruments are playing different parts and every piece, every part is in there. Every note is in there to create the entire structure, top to bottom. If you were to remove one of those, would the general audience know that that was gone? No, probably not. But if they heard it with that piece in there, then they would realize, oh, that is really important to the overall structure. And if that were taken out, we would be missing a major component. And that's true of every part that's written into the orchestral piece. It's there for a reason. It's necessary to the piece. And so we have to have a person on that instrument to fulfill that part. Now, let's move that over to organizations. Let's move that to business. You know, someone may be thinking, I don't know, let's say a role that some people might say that's not important. Someone has to open all of the mail when it comes in. And so maybe it's low skill. Maybe it's not appreciated every day. And does someone every, every day go down to the person who opens the mail and says, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing for us here today. But without that, if that mail does not get opened, you know, how do we get the customer appreciation letters? What if your orders 
come in that way and just on and on and on. That may seem like an insignificant role in your organization, but it's still necessary because you put a person in that role to do that job. And so every part is necessary. And Seneca, I know you're going to love this, uh, (laughs) talking about everyone having a great work day. And I'm a former trainer too. We all need to be connected to the bigger picture. We all need to know that even if all I'm doing is slicing open envelopes, that has this kind of an impact on the rest of the organization. And if I were not here opening these envelopes and opening the mail, something would be missed down the road. Absolutely. Daniel, you're speaking my language here. Within the Your Clear Next Step structure and and what we teach our clients as well is each individual, not only in our one-on-ones, not only do they have their roles or their description or their responsibilities, here's what you're supposed to do, but we have a conversation about, do you understand how this organization needs you to do that? Do you understand how you really fit into our bigger purpose? Because if um, even with our interns, when we got temporary college interns working with us, I still want to make sure that each person understands how the, the role that you're doing without it, the overall structure of our organization doesn't work because you are integral to that piece. I love the, I love the analogy of the orchestra on that. That's really beautiful. So what instrument do you have a favorite that you prefer to play just, just for fun, not because of melody or where it fits, knowing they're all important, but do you have a, a favorite that you, you play? <laughs> I do. Yes. So there's my major instrument, which was trumpet. There's, uh, I play bass guitar on the occasional Sunday at church, which I love to play. Another one of my all-time favorite instruments to play though, is French horn. I like playing French horn. I like the feel of it. I like the sound of it. I like how it fits into that structure. Like we've talked about, that's one of my favorite instruments to play. I don't get to play it very often, but it's fun to play. Outstanding. Outstanding. Okay. So back to it. We're five things and that you learned about business from conducting an orchestra. We talked about vision and planning as the first one. We talked about the fact that everyone has a part as the second one. So let's move to communication. Another one of my favorite topics, communication, it's, it's critical and it's hard and it's not about me. I mean, these are things that we know about communication. So how does that play out into an orchestra? What, what does communication have to do with an orchestra? Oh, wow. In a business, in an organization, we know we've all seen failures of communication, right? We know how critical it is to have good communication. And Seneca, I know this is one of the things that you teach to your clients and in some of the classes that you teach is how communication is made up. We talk about nonverbal communication and the tone of voice that we use and the words that we choose and how it really comes down to the words that we use is just such a small part of our overall communication. We get so much of the meaning of communication from nonverbal body language. And when you take away that aspect in a business, (laughs) say we're on the phone or worst, we send an email and we don't think about how our words are going to be received on the other end. You know, how many communications have just blown out of proportion because of a a thoughtless email or an email that didn't have enough thought put into it. So when we look at an orchestra, we've got nonverbal body language up front. The conductor is communicating with the ensemble through only nonverbal communication, through their conducting gestures. Those conducting gestures are not up there to be Mr. Metronome and say, okay, here's the beat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. But there's more communication that's going on. When you watch a skillful conductor in front of an ensemble, on the spot, in the moment, they're saying, hey, a little more from you. No, a little less from you. Okay, now let's really bring this up all together. No, let's back this off now. And and so there is a tremendous amount of nonverbal communication that's taking place, even when it's live, even when you're in a live performance, Mm -hmm. things are changing and moving and the conductor is making changes in the moment through their nonverbal communication. Beyond that, each of the members of the orchestra that are sitting there together have to know how to listen from one side of the ensemble across to the other side and listen to how did that instrument just play that part because I have the same thing coming up in a moment. I want to play the exact same way that they did. So there's 
nonverbal communication, or in this case, it is going to be, there's going to be some auditory communication because it's music, <laughs> but that's coming from one side of the ensemble to the other. So even the players have to communicate with each other or let's break it down and let's make it really intimate. Let's talk about chamber music or let's talk about a jazz trio or a jazz quartet who are constantly playing off of each other. There's structure to the music that this jazz ensemble is playing, but a large portion of that is made up on the spot. So they have to be able to make eye contact and say, okay, your turn now. They need to be able to play out a, a melodic segment and then the drums or the piano have to be able to react to that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of communication that takes place in the moment all across the ensemble and every player is involved. And then we come down to looking at a piece of music on the stand. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been trained to read music, essentially you're looking at code mm -hmm. on this piece of music. Mm -hmm. And only so much can be communicated through musical code. A lot of the, the rest of it I mentioned earlier is prone to interpretation. The composer can only say so much on the page. They can give you indications about make it louder here, make it softer here, but those are just indications. The performer has to be able to interpret that. Yeah. And now we have to try to take this code that the composer has communicated to us and make something of it in real life. Classic. So my older daughter plays the violin and the viola. And as she was learning the viola, the, the translation, she reads music, but she, she has to read a different clef, right? It's a different key signature now. And, and so she's got to read the viola clef and okay, that learn a new code, right? Learn to decode those and, and translate the note that you see on the page into what you do with your hands and how you produce sound with your the position of your fingers and the bow on the, on the instrument. So learning that code and then thinking about, you know, just how much fun it is to watch her in the college community orchestra that she plays in and watching the conductor and, and you did exactly what you're describing there with a little bit more from you, a little bit less from you or bring it all together now. And, and he's uh, highly animated and then watching in chamber. She's, she's also in a chamber group that when she plays in the chamber that they're, they're without that. And sometimes in business, right? We're without a specific leader, the leader, the, the business owner, the executive is not in the room with us, but we as team members have to communicate amongst each other, right? We have to lead ourselves, if you will, through that particular event. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful analogy. My gosh, so this is, I could go all sorts of directions. We better just keep moving. So thinking about five things you learned about business from conducting an orchestra. We talked about vision and planning and everyone has a part and communication. Let's talk about harmony and dissonance. Those are terms that I'm familiar with. I come from a musical background. Not everybody does. So hopefully you'll define those. But what is what what do you mean about harmony and dissonance? Harmony seems pretty self-evident, but maybe you can clarify more. And then how does that play out in business? Sure. Right. So let's take the musical terms first of all. And I think for those two terms, most people may understand how to apply those at large to life. So harmony, things are coming together, things are working. So whether we're on a team or maybe it's family unit, but things are working really well together. We're all on the same page, so to speak. But things are all coming together and working well. Dissonance then would be where things are not working well together. Our team can't seem to come together. We can't figure out what we want to do at the same time. We've got disagreements going on. So there's some dissonance there. In music, if you listen very, very closely, music is made up of both. We have to have both. We want harmony where all the notes in a stack from top to bottom all sound really nice together. And those are really good moments. Think about maybe a slow piece of music and you hear a really nice chord and you just think, ah, oh, I love that chord. It's not the harmony that drives the piece of music though. It's the dissonance. It's those notes that don't quite align together and they give us just a little bit of an edge. And when we hear that dissonance in a piece of music, there's something in us that wants to move past it because of course we don't like dissonance. We all want to be in harmony. 
So when we hear that, we want to hear a change in the music. And then when we come back to that harmony, then once again, we get that feeling of, ah, oh, everything's right again. Yes. But if the piece of music were only made up of harmony, those chords or those notes that sound good together, there wouldn't be any motion to the piece. We would be in the lazy river, <laughs> so to speak, of a piece of music going, okay, well, we started it and we got to the end. Uh -huh, yeah, okay, well, that was nice. <laughs> So that dissonance is what drives us forward. So let's apply that to business now. Where do we see signs of dissonance? We see that, you know, great example. We all just went through a pandemic and boy, wasn't that dissonant. Didn't that disrupt our business? Let's take some different scenarios. Let's say we've come together in a committee meeting and we're trying to figure this out. We've got to hash out this project we're working on and figure out what the next steps are going to be. And everyone's got their own ideas. We've got dissonance going on. Can we work through that dissonance, though, to come to an understanding where we come back to harmony? If you got into a conference room with a committee and tried to figure out what the next steps were and everyone agreed, that's actually not a good situation. <laughs> if everyone in the organization agrees, then you are overlooking some very important things. This is my opinion, all right? <laughs> Someone is free to disagree with me if you want to. And then we've got dissonance. You want people in the room with a different perspective, with different sets of expertise, who can bring some different ideas to the table so that then you can work together as a team and figure out what's the best way that we can move forward. And you want that inside your organization on a regular basis. So you're constantly trying to have hash out new ideas. This is where innovation comes from, is new ideas. And how can we make this work? A lot of times I see teams, uh, I've been on teams even myself, where sometimes someone will just get stuck in that, no, that won't work frame of mind. And instead, we want to change that to how can we make this work so we can move from that dissonance back to harmony. And you can apply that to all sorts of things. When legislation disrupts our business, when customers buying habits change and that disrupts our business, that puts us in dissonance, but it gives us that opportunity to innovate, to create, and to come back to a harmony point. Absolutely. So I want to visit, explore a couple of these a little bit deeper. One of them is the idea of like the smooth sailing, the, the lazy river, when we all just, there, there's not discord or there's not dissonance and there's not difference of opinion. We're, we're all saying the same thing. As a career project manager, I recall being at a conference once and the, the speaker invited us to go big, be in breakout groups and then come back together. And, and he made the observation, he said, sure, as a group of project managers, you can agree vehemently about everything for five minutes. And, and so we were, we were all these agreeable, everybody's just agreeing with everybody at the table. And it was fun and entertaining for, for five minutes, but it's not really how you move forward. Right? It's not really how you make progress or, or try new things or stretch or, or challenge yourself. That reminds me of the, maybe you even know the, the source better than I do, but the idea behind the, the 10th, I've, I've heard it called the 10th man or the 10th person. If you've got nine people in a room that all agree, this is what we should do. You, you have to look to that 10th person to say, wait, we need you to disagree because it's dangerous that we all would agree and we would get into that group thing. Right. Right. It definitely can be. Yeah. And you have to give some value and some credibility to that dissenting opinion. Absolutely. And I think when, when I look at the team dynamics and the team structure that we teach on, it's around having enough in your team that you've got diversity of thought. And so then this, that word diversity brings us into other conversations that we as a society need to be having right now. And I, I think for many, many years, it's been very comfortable to, well, we've got a bunch of Midwestern Iowans in the room and, and we all think the same. We all grew up the same from neighborhood from, you know, just down the street from each other or down the gravel road from each other. And so we think the same and, and so we operate the same and it's comfortable that way. And when we, when we allow for that diversity of thought for, for different people from different cultures, different backgrounds, different states, different parts of the state, even for heaven's sakes, like when we start to broaden that and have that diversity of thought, it can be uncomfortable. And, and it can be those moments that, that we want to move past. But I think what you're describing is, as in the music, we don't get over it. We move past it into something even better. Is that fair? Right, exactly. We don't want to rush through it. We don't want to avoid it. We need to embrace it and then figure out what comes out of it. 
Yeah, right. it'll, it'll be so much more, so much more beautiful on the other side. Really lovely. Okay, five things you learned about business from conducting an orchestra. I'm, I'm so bought in on all of this so far. So vision and planning, everyone has a part. Communication, the fourth one was harmony and dissonance. And we're moving on to the last one, which is who's responsible. This is, this is interesting. So who, who is responsible in an orchestra, Daniel? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. And I chose this point, especially because responsibility, who's responsible, accountability. Uh, this is where we can start talking about job roles and responsibilities. This is very near and dear to me uh, coming from some doing some training in some corporate uh, settings around town here where we are. Everyone needs to know what their responsibility is. This is why HR people spend so much time crafting job descriptions. So if you're the leader and you're working with HR and they're really asking you tough questions about the job description and the roles and responsibilities, don't get frustrated with them. They're doing this for a reason. It's because when someone moves into that role, into that job, they need to know, they need to have very clear boundaries. This is what I'm supposed to do. And the rest of it is not what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> That's someone else's responsibility. That is so important to know. So let's go back orchestra. Let's talk about our treble voices and our middle voices and then our bass voices in that pyramid of sound and who's responsible for what. You might think that it's important for those melody voices at the top. You might think, oh, that's really important. They really need to bring out the melody and we need to hear that loud and clear. Absolutely, we do. Here's what a good conductor knows. The melody will always come out. You never have to overemphasize the melody. What a good conductor knows is that we need to reach into the middle. Those middle voices are the ones that need to be brought out and you need to spend a lot of time working there. Even the bass voices at the bottom. Look at an orchestra, a string orchestra, and you'll notice it is very top heavy. We have a lot of violins. We have a few violas. We've got fewer cellos and we may only have two or three basses in an orchestra because those basses are going to come through. They are supporting there. But if you listen to an orchestra, how often do you hear that viola part? How often do you hear that cello part? You really have to work hard to bring out those inner parts. So now let's talk about who's ultimately responsible in the organization. And of course, the person who's standing right up front. The conductor is ultimately responsible for everything in terms of vision and planning. Yep. How about execution? We're standing there at a concert, the orchestra's playing, the conductor is conducting, and somebody plays a wrong note. Is that the conductor's responsibility? <laughs> so mistakes get made, of course. There again, though, who is ultimately responsible? Did the conductor ever say to that person in rehearsal, nope, that's a wrong note? Did they ever point that out? Or was this just a one-time mistake that happened because the player was nervous right. in the performance. So, but you know, when it comes to the owner of a business, your employees messing up, they, they've got a bad attitude, they're disrupting, they're sabotaging things. Who's ultimately responsible? You know, owner, it's probably you. Did you ever sit down and have a conversation with this person about their performance? And if you have, you know, when do you reach the point when it's time to say, you know, I'm not sure that uh, this is really a, a good fit for you anymore. Let's see if we can find some way to help you be more successful, either in a different role or maybe with a different organization. And I've talked with so many people, Seneca, I'm sure you have too, who have said, you know what? I let it go on for way too long, for much longer than it should have. It really worked out best when we finally decided to part ways. So ultimately, owner of a business, if things are not going the way that you want them to go in your business, who's ultimately responsible? You are. Yep. You know, if I'm the orchestra conductor standing in front of the orchestra and they don't sound the way that I want them to, who's ultimately responsible? It's me, the conductor. For sure. For sure. In the project management space, we, we use the analogy that if the project goes well, the team gets all the credit. And if the project goes badly, the project manager takes the blame. 
And, and there is truth there, right? So it just as if you're leading a business, if the business is doing well, then credit goes to every member or the, if the orchestra sounds great, credit goes to every member of the orchestra, everybody who's playing a part and doing what they're supposed to do and contributing to the richness of, of this experience. And if it goes badly, somewhere along the line, the conductor, the business owner, the project leader, the, the leader, somewhere, we, we dropped a ball, we, we let someone down, we didn't clarify expectations, we didn't equip someone with the tools or the skills or the practice that we needed, that they needed. We, we own it, we, we let them down. And, Ultimately, if it goes well, everybody gets the credit. But if it if there's a problem, I I got to take the blame on that one. Yes, very true. And to your point about the roles and responsibilities and the the job description, right? How many people in corporate America take their job description and just put it in a drawer? Like I don't even want to look at this thing. But I remember a an article or a, a somebody who, who shared the message that the vast majority of us in the workforce we really just want to know what is expected of us and how are we doing compared mm-hmm. to what's expected. And, and you can't have a conversation with someone about their performance, about how well they're doing compared to expectations. If you haven't stopped and had, here's the expectation, here's your, here's your role, here's your job description, here, is the, here are the boundaries, here's your sandbox, here's what I expect of you, and, and maybe a dialogue to say, what do you expect of yourself as well, so that we're, we're doing that together. But if we don't start there, we can't hold someone accountable. No, no. Uh, too often, we don't tell our team members this is what good performance looks like. And so a lot of times our team members are left to their own devices to try to figure something out. And all they have to do is experiment. So they try something and, and they get in trouble. And we slap their hands and they say, oh, okay, so don't do it that way. But they still have to figure out how they should be doing it. So tell them what good looks like. And that's part of the job description. So when I'm the conductor and I'm teaching my students, I have to give them that instruction. What good sounds like? No, I want you to play it like this. No, I want you to play with this kind of a tone. Yep. And 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 then help them help them practice it, help them have opportunities to to try and and celebrate them when they when they do it right. Yes. Oh, this is lovely. So my background is in literature. And so in the same way that you draw these parallels out of music, I have found similar parallels in literature. And it's it's so fun to, to see this from yet another angle where that, that liberal arts education or that background in something other than math and science or even math and science and language, you, you get something else and you bring this richness of the artistic and the creative experience. So if you are looking, I'm, I'm now going to make a plea out to anyone who's listening to this and you're thinking, oh, I want to someday run my own business. Or I want to have a, a leadership role in a business organization. Don't limit yourself to just business classes, right? Get that richness of, of, of literature, of art, of music, and enrich your experience because you will come out a stronger, better, wiser leader because of it. Absolutely. I'd reiterate all of that, Seneca. <laughs> Yay. Well, we are coming down to time here. And one of the questions that I always like to wrap our interviews up, because this is the Even Better podcast, is, Daniel, what is making you even better these days? What is making me better? Just as if I were a musician and I'm trying to grow in my music, I am going to go find a teacher. I'm going to go find someone who can teach me technique and teach me the music who can help me to grow. They're going to give me the insight, the wisdom, the experience. They're going to be that outside perspective for me to help me figure out where to go next, but then also give me that perspective of, you know, hey, cut yourself some slack. <laughs> You're not going to be perfect yet. <laughs> it's not the first going to take a little time to work on this. So I do the same in my business too. Even though I'm doing coaching and consulting with other business owners, I rely on a business coach myself. There are things that I need to learn about business where I am not an expert. One of those things where I am not an expert is in the area of sales. I am actually working with a sales coach to help me in my business. So I have people watching out for me. I have my own informal board of directors, so to speak, who I can call on anytime and ask for advice, ask for their input into growing my business. That's what I do. I rely on outside perspective because I have to realize I don't know it all. And I need to reach out to people who are experts 
in their own fields and ask them for their input and their guidance. Thank you, that's awesome. So as we bring this to a close, Daniel, I'm so grateful for your time. So one of the things that I know you do is that you reach out and you help those hurried and worried and buried business owners, help them really grow and find more success in their business. If someone wanted to reach out to you, Daniel, what's the, what's the best way for them to reach you? Sure. Well, there's a number of ways they can do that. And thank you, Seneca. Phone number would be one great way to do that. And so my phone number, that's 515-992-9444. Email would be another great way to do that. And you can reach me, daniel at mccrane.com. You can also check out my website, which is fixthisbiz.coach would be another great way to reach out to me. And then you can get some more information about how I help some of my clients on that website. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Daniel, it's been such a joy to spend this time with you. Thank you for indulging us in this conversation. And thank you for taking us on this musical journey. I am super grateful. Oh, well, thank you, Seneca. These are things that I've talked about in pieces with clients and with other people that I work with. I've never had a chance to put it all together in one conversation like this. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And for all of you who are listening in, thank you so much for listening in. And this has been the Even Better Podcast. And on behalf of all of us here at Your Clear Next Step, we hope the rest of your day is even better. Thank you for tuning in today. The Even Better Podcast will be back with more content soon. But in the meantime, subscribe to our podcast or check out our website at yourclearnextstep.com for more information. See you next episode.